So you got your hormone replacement therapy plus protocol all figured out. And now Pandora's box has literally been opened and hundreds upon hundreds upon hundreds of other performance enhancing drugs are screaming at you to be consumed and enjoyed for their unique characteristics. Coach Steve, your online steroid daddy is here to make sense of it all and tell you which PDs are suitable for beginners as they cause the least harm compared to the other ones you can choose from and are probably more interested in anyway. Just keep in mind that none of these are 100% safe, so don't get too excited. Vigorous Steve here. In this video, we'll discuss the best entry-level beginner PDs, which all have manageable side effects and somewhat low risk profile, allowing you to have a successful outcome of the first couple of cycles that you're doing after you figured out which HRT Plus protocol worked best for you. And again, I must emphasize that there are no safe performance enhancing drugs out there. So I would still advise you to do additional research because some of the compounds which we'll discuss in this video might still potentiate side effects, especially if you start escalating the dose upwards. And with that out of the way, let's get into the cookie cutter hormone replacement therapy plus protocol, which forms the foundation of all beginner PEDs, which we're now going to stack one on top of the other. Obviously, there should be a testosterone base right, for normal serum estradiol and DHT levels, unless you suffer from a hair loss, but that's not what this video is about. You can choose between a testosterone and any ester, basically. Um, I would recommend a foundation of, let's say, 100 milligrams testosterone up to 250 milligrams testosterone for this entire protocol to work. Feel free to increase that, but it entirely depends on you and how much experience you have with testosterone as your base. And I would recommend DHA and pregnenolone to sustain your neurosteroid levels when you take testosterone as a base. In many cases, you see that the neurosteroid levels slowly start to decline, and thus you need to supplement with them a dose just between 25 milligrams to 50 milligrams DHEA, and let's say 10 milligrams up to 25 milligrams pregnenolone. Again, do your blood work to see where your total testosterone, free testosterone, serum estradiol, sexual hormone globulin, DHEA sulfate, and pregnenolone sulfate, if you can test for those levels. I would recommend between 250 IOs to 500 IOs HCG three times per week to sustain testicular function. But I explain all of this in depth in the various HRT Plus videos that I have on my YouTube channel. I'll link it down below and at the end of this one. Then you could choose between growth hormone, let's say one to two IOs before bed or before activity to initiate a little bit of lipolysis. Or if you want to, because they're easily accessible, growth hormone secretagogues, right? A popular combination is tessamorelin and ipermorelin. The details are on the screen, but we'll get more to that a little bit later on. And I have very in-depth videos on how to maximize your growth hormone secretion when you use growth hormone secreted gogs with various over-the-counter supplements and practices also linked down below. Of course, you can look into blood pressure management, whether that's Cialis or Thelmasartan, and to control your serum estradiol levels, you can choose between dynomethane and calcium deglucurate, or exemestane, better known as aromacin. But if you go with aromacin, just make sure you do your blood work frequently because at moderate dosages of HRT+, plus, you might not need an aromatized inhibitor. And especially if you start stacking injectable anabolic androgenic steroids on top, which are known to inhibit the conversion of testosterone into estradiol, then you probably don't need aromacin or another aromatized inhibitor at all, right? This is why we do blood work to keep track of our blood work parameters, particularly estradiol and SHBG to a certain extent. So let's get started with the first line of options, the least harmful oral anabolic androgenic steroids or selective androgen receptor modulators. And I can't even believe that I'm recommending SARMs as a beginner PED, but hey, sometimes steroids like Provirin, Oral Turinabol, or Anavar are hard to source and sometimes even faked, especially the case with Anavar. So it might be easier for you as a beginner who have who has now dialed in his HRT Plus protocol to source SARMs online on the gray area peptide websites or the SARM websites. But if you have access to real steroids and you trust your source, then I would forego Austrian completely, even though Austrian has been extensively studied now, certainly more than the other selective androgen receptor modulators that are out there. It has not been studied as much as Provirin, Turinabol, or Anavar. So there's a lot more scientific evidence that you can do research with and this is why i prefer steroids over sarms maybe in a couple decades austrian will come out as the winner but for now i would say steroids are better than sarms so you could use proviron right to bring your sexual hormone globulin levels down which is the only real practical application of proviron at dosages between 6.25 milligrams up to 25 milligrams daily but proviron is a very poor muscle builder it has little anabolic properties if any, and if your sex hormone binding globulin levels are already in range and your HRT plus protocol and your libido is fan 
fantastic because you do daily micro-administrations, then Provirin you should abstain from because otherwise your sex hormone binding globulins levels will kind of crash and now your libido is gone and your gains might be inhibited, right? So there's a very small practical application for Provirin, but I thought I'd give it an honorable mention here. I think Turinabol is the best option on this list because Turinabol is not commonly faked, unlike Anavar, unfortunately, which is superior to Turinabol. But let's continue with Turinabol first. Right, Turinabol does not really have any negative effect on the conversion of testosterone into estradiol. So if you add that on HRT+, you don't need to do additional blood work until you're a couple of weeks into it to check your liver enzymes and your serum lipid levels because Turinabol doesn't seem to affect aromatization in any way, shape, or form. Will SSUBG come down? Obviously, but not as much, dose-dependent-wise, compared to Provirin, and you actually get a good amount of anabolism out of the Turinabol dose, let's say 10 milligrams to 30 milligrams daily. And keep in mind that oral Turinabol was actually designed for athletes. And again, if you trust your source or you have access to real pharmaceutical Oxandrolone, or you can get Oxandrolone from the compounding pharmacy on prescription on top of your HRT+, plus, then you don't need to look anywhere else because Oxandrolone Anivar is superior to all other oral anabolic androgenic steroids or selective androgen receptor modulators, right? And I already made a very detailed best dose of Anavar video. I'll link it down below. Give that one a watch so you can convince yourself. And otherwise, well, there's always Austrian, right? And the main reason why I didn't include the Anabol, Winstrol, Oral Primabolin, Anadrol, Superdrol, Halotestin, Metribolone, Check Drops, Prohormones, Legandrol, Rad140, Andarine, S23, AC262, or YK11 is because they have more side effects than the other oral steroids or SARMs, which I just highlighted, and the risk profile is generally higher, albeit that you might get a better result. But first, get your hands dirty with the least harmful oral steroids or SARMs, so you can get a little bit of experience. And then if you know your body well, you know how your blood work changes are taking place with the multiple iterations of going in for blood work, then you can proceed to the Dianabol, or you can proceed to the Winstrol or the Legandrol, if you're a SARM goblin and online sourcing is an issue for you, right? I mean, there's about a lot of options out there. I'm just giving you some suggestions, but the foundation should still remain. Get some experience, get your hands dirty with at least harmful oral steroids or SARMs, and then you can proceed if you have a firm grasp of your blood work changes. So let's proceed to the least harmful injectable anabolic androgenic steroids that might be suitable beginner PEDs. And you might notice a recurring detail the dosages are reasonably low, whether those are the oral steroids or SARMs or the injectable steroids. Dosages are low because as a beginner, the dose is the poison. So if you want to go with Nandrolone for joint lubrication, for example, and you're during your off-season, so a little bit of bloat and water retention doesn't really matter for you, then I would start with 50 milligrams to 200 milligrams Nandrolone on top of your TRT base, um, making sure that your Nandrolone is about 50% of your testosterone dose. So if your HRT plus protocol consists of 100 milligrams testosterone per week, then I would start with 50 milligrams Nandrolone. And if you do 250 milligrams testosterone per week, then I would start at, let's say, 125 milligrams Nandrolone. But if you take more as your testosterone base, let's say 400, 500, maybe 1,000, right? It entirely depends on you. If you take a bottle out of testosterone, then I would go up to 200 milligrams of Nandrolone, which seems to be the most effective dose where you get joint rubrication, but not a tremendous negative effect on your blood work parameters. And again, we're trying to mitigate side effects when it comes to blood work, water retention, uh, blood pressure increases, etc. But before you add in the Nandrolone, make sure you have a firm grasp of your serum estradiol levels, because Nandrolone is a metabolic intermediate in the conversion of testosterone into estradiol. And if you take exogenous Nandrolone, it seems that the conversion of testosterone into estradiol increases. If you're using an aromatized inhibitor on your hormone replacement therapy plus protocol, then again, do your blood work to get a baseline and see if you need to increase your AI after you add the Nandrolone in. You check your serum estradiol levels four weeks into making this adjustment, adding Nandrolone on top of your HRT plus base. And alternatively, which is what I would prefer, is either Equipoise, Primabolin, or Mastrone at low dosages between 100 milligrams to 300 milligrams weekly, again, depending on your HRT plus protocol testosterone dose, I would start with a one-to-one -one ratio of testosterone and boldenone or testosterone and primabolin or testosterone and mastrone, right? You have to make a choice which one seems the most reasonable for you as a beginner PED, but the one-to-one -one ratio we do 
to inhibit the conversion of testosterone into estradiol because that's what equipoise, primobolin, amastrone, and most of their metabolites actually do. Thus, you minimize or remove the need for an aromatized inhibitor, but this dose of one-to-one -one seems to be a good starting point for most people. And of course, individual aromatized enzyme expression in adipose tissue highly contributes to the rate of conversion. So again, do your blood work and injection frequency contributes, or if you take a bottle of phytoestrogens because you're a soy boy, right? You never really know. So do your blood work to adjust the ratio. I mean, you might end up with a two to one ratio of testosterone to your secondary injectable anabolic androgenic steroid that you decided to go with. But again, the foundation still remains blood work, blood work, blood work, and then adjust the dosages or the ratios. Now, if you go with equipoise, keep in mind that there's a lot of scientific evidence that shows that equipoise might be kidney toxic, both in animal models and human subjects. I did an extensive deep dive, a two-parter on the kidney toxicity that boldenone might potentiate. I'll link them down below. Just keep in mind that these studies have not been performed on other anabolic androgenic steroids besides Trenbolone. So even though there's no scientific evidence that uh, confirms that primobolin is kidney toxic or mastrone is kidney toxic, doesn't mean it's not kidney toxic, right? Keep this in mind. Absence of evidence isn't evidence of absence. Now, that being said, I kind of debunked some of this scientific evidence in the deep dives, which I linked down below. So please give those a watch if you're interested in boldenone. I feel it's worth mentioning here. My personal preference would be primabolin, even though pharmaceutical Bayer Rimabolin might be hard to source. And if you can source it, it's mad expensive, but it's the Bay, the best injectable steroid you can do after your testosterone base. But with UGL Primo, you're never really sure if it's 100% accurately dosed or methanolone at all. And sterility or heavy metal contamination aside, always make sure you do third-party testing on every batch of UGL Primo that you get, so you know you get what you paid for. Still, all considerations aside, if you can get your hands on legitimate Prima Bolin, it's probably the best secondary beginner PED that you can add on top of your HRT base, uh, even better than Anavar or the other oral steroids or SARMs, because injectable Prima Bolin, again, uh, allows you to remove any kind of aromatized inhibitor if you start with a one-to-one -one ratio of testosterone to Prima Bolin at dosages, let's say between 100 milligrams to 300 milligrams weekly. But that highly depends on your weekly testosterone intake, which is part of your HRT Plus protocol, all right? So keep all of this into consideration. Sourcing is always a little bit of an issue. And usually with Mastrone, which is probably a little bit easier to source, sometimes it's just faked with testosterone propionate. So please do your blood work every single time you add in one of these beginner PDs, because if blood work parameters change to uh, numbers, values that you didn't really expect, then you can probably uh, assess and assume that whatever you added on top of your HRT Plus protocol base is fake and not what you paid for. Now, just keep in mind that besides Nandrolone, none of these compounds are hair safe. And if you're already using a 5 alpha reductase inhibitor like finasteride or dutasteride to keep your hairline intact when you're using exogenous testosterone, which converts into dihydro testosterone, which is not hair safe, then keep in mind that nandrolone converts into dihydronandrolone. And I would advise you, if you use finasteride or dutasteride, to start with a very, 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 very low dose of nandrolone, because now the finasteride and dutasteride are also inhibiting the conversion of nandrolone into dihydronandrolone, which is basically metabolically benign. It potentiates no negative effects or beneficial effects, but it just means that similar to serum testosterone levels increasing after adding in a 5-alpha reductase inhibitor, if you're already on a 5-alpha reductase inhibitor and you add the nandrolone in, then you get disproportionately high serum nandrolone levels, and thus your aromatized enzyme inhibition in the form of an aromatized inhibitor needs to increase as well, right? I mean, the side effects of um, the 5 alpha reductase inhibitors includes gynecomastia. So if your serum estradiol levels are under control because you're only focusing on your dihydro testosterone levels, um, yeah, think again and make sure you do your blood work when you start stacking testosterone, nandrolone, and 5 alpha reductase inhibitors. And the reason why I don't like Trimbolone, injectable winstrol, mint, DHB, or Stenbolone as suitable beginner PEDs is because First of all, some of these are pretty hard to source, so beginners might not even have access to it. The post-injection pain might be terrible with injectable winstrol, mint, or DHB. Well, obviously, Trimbolone is not a beginner PD because it comes with a longer list of side effects and things you need to put in place for health management. 
even at 50 milligrams to 70 milligrams per week, I think Trembolone is not worth it if you're a beginner. And even though it might sound exciting and appealing and also favorable because Trembolone is a nectar of the gods and it uh, basically makes you get results even if you do everything wrong, the side effects that you get from Trembolone just disqualifies it as a beginner PED. But after you got your hands dirty with the beginner PEDs or other PEDs with a lower risk profile compared to Trimbalone, Mint, or DHP, then obviously these now become a consideration, right? But that's entirely up to you. All right, let's proceed to the least harmful metabolic modulators and fat burners. Again, you'll have to make a selection based on the details which are on the screen. Um, don't start stacking all of these together at the same time. You will probably die actually you will certainly die please don't do that okay let's get started with 5 amino 1 mq which is a n-methyltransferase inhibitor increasing nad plus levels in adipose tissue and thus metabolism and fat loss is sustained even if you've been dieting for a very long time or you do a week of fasting for all its benefits i don't know it sounds crazy that some people fast for a week but yeah that's also being done 5-amino uh, 1-mq is very good to keep fat loss continuous as you get leaner without uh, slowing fat loss down. But the main problem with 5-amino-1-MQ is that it's hard to source, it's very expensive, and there's limited scientific literature for us to review. You could consider albuterol, also known as salbutamol, instead of clenbuterol, which will certainly increase your heart rate. At 2 milligrams pre-fasted cardio once per day, I think that albuterol is uh, quite benign when it comes to elevated heart rate, even though it might still increase your heart rate because it works on the beta-adrenergic receptors but it might also potentiate a good amount of fat loss so again it highly depends on what you prefer i would uh, put it a little bit lower on the priority list compared to some of the other options because it's known to increase your heart rate and might have an overlapping deleterious effects to the other uh, peds or caffeine or adderall or whatever else that you're taking i'm not entirely sure what else you're stacking with your hrt plus protocol but it is a, a better option than clenbuterol which can make you cramp like crazy or increase your heart rate to very, very, very uncomfortable levels. Just like with clenbuterol, you need to supplement with taurine at let's say 5,000 milligrams per day to keep those cramps at bay and to supply your heart with adequate amount of taurine for its increased heart rate to stay healthy. All right, there's anti-obesity drug 9604, which is a derivative or a partial sequence of growth hormone. I don't think that anti-obesity drug 9604 or HGH frag 176 to 191, I don't think that's going to do anything regarding lipolysis and fat loss uh, when you're already taking growth hormone. But if you're taking growth hormone secretagogues and you're a little bit older, so how much growth hormone secretion will you get when you take growth hormone secretagogues when growth hormone secretion goes down with age? You might be able to get additional benefits regarding fat loss. Um, with anti-obesity drug 9604 or growth hormone fragment 176-191, right? Keep that into consideration. Carnitine, either oral or injectable, even though injectable carnitine burns like crazy. We have a gastric inhibitory polypeptide, also known as glucose-dependent insulinotropic polypeptide receptor agonists in the form of terzepatide and retrotrutide or glucagon-like peptide one uh, receptor agonist in the form of liraglutide, duloglutide, semaglutide, and terzepatide and ritidrutide, which both contain GIP and GLP-1, uh, dosed every day or every other day because at higher dosages once per week, side effects like nausea or gastrointestinal problems, flatulence, acid reflux, all the bad stuff start to occur. So if you go with GLP-1s or in combination with GIP medication, Keep the dose low, but dose it frequently so you have continuous beneficial appetite suppression without any of the negative effects which are commonly associated with these kinds of medications. Alongside the growth hormone secretagogues, there are a boatload of them. There's the growth hormone releasing hormone receptor agonists, CJC1295 with the drug affinity complex or without it, somatorelin, sermorelin or tesamorelin in combination with the ghrelin receptor agonist, either growth hormone releasing peptide 2 or 6, Exomorelin, Ipromorelin, or even Ibutomorin, MK677. I had already made a very detailed video about how to stack growth hormone secretagogues together with over the counter supplements and other practices to increase growth hormone secretion. I'll link it down below. There's DW501516, better known as Cardrin, 10 milligrams pre fasted cardio daily, which seems to be the non cancerous dose. I'll release a best dose of Cardrin video sometime next week 
where we interpret all the scientific evidence, whether those are pro-cancer or anti-cancer of cargarine. There's metformin, 500 milligrams before bed, methylene blue, 2 milligrams to 10 milligrams upon waking daily, SR9009, maybe once or twice per day in the morning and before cardio later in the day, and thyroxine T4, which I feel is only beneficial if you're taking either a growth hormone secretagogues or actual real exogenous pharmaceutical or generic growth hormone. Without growth hormone secretagogues or pharmaceutical growth hormone or generic growth hormone, I don't think that thyroxine T4 is uh, required. And all of these, if used at low and effective doses, which I mentioned on the screen, should potentiate little to zero side effects in the short term. But if you start doing a research, which again is highly, highly, highly advised, you will find out that these kinds of compounds can certainly potentiate side effects short term or long term, which seems to be dose dependent and also health status dependent. For example, albuterol again will increase your heart rate. The GLP-1s and GAP a combination or solo medication might have uh, issues with thyroid or the pancreas. You can see that growth hormone secretagogues can increase cortisol levels or prolactin. Right? GW501516 might cause cancer if abused at higher dosages. Metformin will make you flat and lower your IGF-1 levels. And methylene blue, if abused, can crush your hematocrit and total red blood cell counts. SR9009 can keep you awake if you take it too late because it controls circadian rhythm. So again, none of these are completely side effect free or 100% safe. Please, please, please do additional research before you consider these entry level beginner PEDs. And if you do do your research and you start stacking them on top of each other conservatively, maybe adding in one compound at a time, getting some experience for a month in duration, doing your blood work before and after, and then see which other compounds you want to add on top or maybe replace for something similar, right? That is the correct way of uh, continuing your performance enhancing drug protocol and journey. And that way you can have a positive outcome of your first couple of cycles and laugh all the way to your goals. Let's leave it here. Thank you guys so much for watching. You can find everything that I'm associated with and all the other videos that I made on beginner PEDs down below. Follow me on Instagram and TikTok at Vigor Steve. Vigor Crew, you guys know what to do. A front double massive for you guys. I hope it was informative. Make sure you hit that like button and subscribe now if you're not subscribed yet for way more than um, entry level beginner PDs. We'll go in depth and get to all the juicy stuff eventually. Thank you guys so much for watching and I'll see you in the next one.